Welcome back to Earth and Life Science Subject. For today's session, we're going to talk about the history of the Earth. Humans have been wondering about the Earth's history 4.6 billion years ago. A better understanding on how old the Earth is and how brief humans' existence has been at work. Geologists have a similar goal when investigating the Earth. They try to determine the order of events that lead to how Earth looks today. They rely on rocks and fossils in determining whether an object or event is older or younger than other objects or events. That's why I have a question for those who are listening on this video. So the question goes this way. How do you know about the Earth's past geology? Okay, most of the time, what we see around us are individual pieces of rocks. But sometimes, especially when we go to an excursion, we pass by the side of mountains and see huge rocks whose face contains layers of rock. This layering is what we call stratification. As you can see on that picture, stratifications on that mountain is evident. Each layer is what we call stratum. Strata in plural form. Stratum is a layer of sedimentary rock or soil with internally consistent characteristics which distinguish it from other layers. In some references, they call stratum as bed. That's why stratifications or bedding now is the general layout of the strata of a rock. I know that you are familiar with the formation of the sedimentary rocks because the process of the formation of sedimentary rocks is the same true with the formation of strata. Okay, So each stratum of a rock is a layer of compacted and cemented sediments. That's why if we are pertaining to layers of rocks, that type of rock is sedimentary rock. Metamorphic rocks could display some layering or what we call the foliation, but that layering is not a consequence of deposition of sediments. It is a consequence of metamorphism. That's why they are called metamorphic rock because those rocks has undergone stress, heat, and pressure through the process of metamorphism. Of course, if there is formation, there is deformation as well. So deformation of strata due to compressional stresses on rocks over long periods of time cause them to fall. Intrusion of new rock forms, such as intrusive igneous rocks, breaks its uniform layering. That's why as you can see on the background picture, the layer is um, folded. The movement of plates beneath causes a column of sedimentary rocks to rise, descend, or tilt from its original form. That's why exogenic and endogenic processes plays an important role in the modification, or should I say, in the metamorphosis of the different types of rocks. In order for us to understand the evolution of Earth, dating methods are used to reconstruct the history of rocks, minerals, and other materials found on Earth. But before we're going to discuss the two types of dating method, let's discuss first what is all about the law of uniformitarianism. By the beginning of Renaissance, scientists began to speculate that geological time far exceed historical time. In the Age of Enlightenment, Scottish doctor and farmer James Hutton introduced the idea of uniformitarianism. It's a proposition that will become the foundation of geology. And this law states that geological processes that take place today operated in the same manner in the past. This simply means that the geological processes that we observe today also operated in the same way in the past. And we are responsible for the formation of geological features around us. And it is equivalent to the saying that the present is the key to the past. The methodology that marks the birth of geology as modern science was the invention of methods to obtain the age of rocks. 
and there are two types of dating method, the relative and the absolute dating. These methods are used to reconstruct the history of rocks, minerals, and other materials found on Earth. Okay, the first type of dating method is what we call the relative dating. Relative dating is a method used to determine the relative order of geologic events. And this is done through stratigraphy or the succession of rocks, where the order of rock formations correlates to geologic time. The topmost layer suggests that the most recent. In like manner, the oldest rocks are understood to be at the bottom, and that is what we call the law of superimposition. Additional information about relative dating is that this method does not provide actual numerical dates for the rocks, but all are just estimates based on the profile of the strata, which includes chemical composition, rock type, and the presence of organisms, in short, the fossils. Okay, so the other type of dating method is what we call the absolute dating. Absolute dating methods can tell which sediments were deposited first and also the approximate age of the specimen. The most used and accepted form of absolute dating is the radioactive decay dating. Most absolute dating makes use of radiometric methods wherein radioactive minerals are used to compute the age of rocks. When we say radioactive decay, it is the spontaneous breakdown of the nucleus of an atom to release matter and energy. Isotopes which are present in radioactive elements break down at a constant rate. When we say isotopes, two or more atoms that have the same number of protons or atomic number but different number in neutrons or mass number. A perfect example of an isotope is the carbon-14. Carbon-14 refers to the isotope of the element carbon with an atomic mass of 14 because the original element, which is the carbon-12, 12, 12 is the atomic mass. But here, because it is an isotope, the atomic mass of this element is 14. The number 14 gives the combined number of neutrons and protons because in order for you to get the atomic mass, you need to add the number of protons and the number of neutrons. But since we know carbon to always have 6 protons because the atomic number of carbon is 6, that's why it will be always 6, the rest of that number gives the number of neutrons which is 8. So 8 plus 6 is equivalent to 14. That's why carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon-12, okay? Okay, so there are two types of atom in radioactive decay, the parent and the daughter atom. Parent atom is an atom before it will undergo decay, while daughter atom is the atom that has undergone decay. For example, carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. Carbon-14 is the parent atom, while well, nitrogen-14 is the daughter atom. Another is potassium-40 to argon-40 and calcium-40. So potassium-40 is the parent atom, while argon-40 and calcium-40 are the daughter atoms. Another one, uranium-238 is the parent atom, while lead-206 is the daughter atom. Okay, the parent atom here is the carbon-14. Carbon-14 is a radioactive element, meaning it's unstable element, because the number of neutron is not equivalent to the number of proton. As you can see here in that picture, the blue one is the neutron, and the red one is the proton. Let's count the number of neutron and the number of proton in the carbon-14 nucleus. For neutron, there are eight neutrons, and there are six protons in carbon-14 nucleus. After the decay, the carbon-14 now is converted into nitrogen-14 because the number of proton will always dictate the atomic number of an element. So meaning, if we're going to count the number of proton in nitrogen, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so there are seven protons now in nitrogen-14, and the neutron is... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So there are 7 neutrons as well. 
So meaning, the number of proton and the number of neutron in nitrogen-14 is equal. That's why nitrogen-14 now is a stable element. And nitrogen-14 is considered as a daughter atom of the carbon-14. Always remember that the number of proton will determine the atomic number of an element. That's why as you can see on the product of this decay, that is nitrogen-14, try to count the number of protons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So there are 7 protons on the product of this decay. Try to check your periodic table. The 7th element on the periodic table is nitrogen. That's why the name of the product on this decay is nitrogen. And always remember as well that there is an isotope of nitrogen and that is the nitrogen 14. Dating fossils through carbon-14 dating is reliable only for fossils not older than 50,000 years. Some scientists put its reliability below 60,000 years. For fossils older than 50,000 years, the trace amount of carbon-14 that is left is too small to be measured. That's why carbon dating method is often used to date human artifacts. Half-life, on the other hand, refers to the length of time it takes for a radioactive material or element to decrease to half its initial mass through radioactive decay. That's why the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. Another one is potassium-40. One half-life is equivalent to 1.3 billion years. And the other one, uranium-238, one half-life is equivalent to 4.6 billion years. Actually, they use uranium-238 to date the age of Earth. In short, it takes 5,700 years for carbon-14 to decay to its daughter atom, which is the nitrogen-14. And that is considered now as one half-life. Okay, let's have an example. If the original mass of a radioactive element was 50 grams, how much would be left in the parent atom after two half-lives? Okay, so here's what you're going to do. Let's say that the parent atom is carbon-14. So 50 grams of carbon-14. When an organism was alive, it absorbed those 50 grams of carbon-14 somehow. When it was died and fossilized, that carbon-14 began to break down because it's radioactive, means unstable atom. So after one half-life, half of the carbon-14 has broken down into nitrogen-14, which is 25 grams of carbon-14 and 25 grams of nitrogen-14. And it takes 5,700 years for one half-life of carbon-14 to take place. So what will be the answer? For the solution, here's what you're going to do. Always remember the concept of half-life that the half of the parent atom will decay to the other atom and the other half will always remain in the parent atom. Okay, so let's take the sample problem given. Our parent atom here is 50 grams of carbon-14 and it takes 5,700 years for the parent atom to decay to its daughter atom. So you're just going to get the half of the 50 grams and that is 25 grams of nitrogen-14 as the daughter atom. And the other half which is another 25 grams, will remain in the parent atom. That's why the products for the first half-life are 25 grams of nitrogen-14 and 25 grams of carbon-14. But the question is, two half-lives, meaning you're going to add another half-life in order for us to complete the dating. Now, the parent for the second decay is 25 grams of carbon-14 and it takes another 5,700 years for our parent atom to decay to its daughter atoms. So half of the parent atom is 12.5 grams of nitrogen-14, and the other half will still remain to its parent atom, which is 25 grams of carbon-14. Now, go back to the question, how much would be left in the parent atom after two half-lives? So the answer for that is 12.5 grams of carbon-14. And our interpretation for that would be the estimate age of the fossil or rock is 11,400 years old. Here's a Venn diagram to summarize the concepts of dating method, which is the relative and absolute dating. Relative dating determines the order of formation of remains 
using stratigraphic methods, also known as qualitative method of dating. While absolute dating determines the age of remains, using radiometric methods, also known as quantitative method of dating. So the similarities between the two, they provide the order of formation of remains, as well as the age of the remains. A team of geologists collected samples of very old rocks from different parts of the world. They obtained the average quantities of potassium-40 and argon-40 contained per 1 gram of these rocks and recorded them. Using the age of these rocks as estimates for the age of our planet, how old is the Earth? The sample of rocks suggests Earth is at least 3.9 billion years old. Geologists, however, place the age of our planet at around 4.6 billion years. Between 3.9 and 4.6 billion years ago, Earth was an ocean of magma. But after 600 million years, the planet had cooled enough to allow the magma ocean to form a surface layer of solid rigid plate of rock. And this rigid plate of rock was Earth's first crust. And that is what we call now the Pangea. So go back to the question, um, how old is the Earth? So the answer for that, Earth is approximately 4.6 billion years old. Before we end this session, I just want to share with you my quotation. So the quotation goes this way. If you don't know history, meaning you don't know anything, you are like a leaf who doesn't know that it is part of a tree. History is not repeating itself. Actually, it's the people who is repeating history. That's all for today. Thank you for listening and have a good day ahead.